Good morning. Thank you. I'm going to hit a lot of topics this morning. I appreciate everybody coming out this early. Um, let's just get started. I don't have any financial relationships to disclose. Uh, I should also mention that um, I will be discussing on-label and off-label uses of uh, a couple of different devices. I'll, I'll always point that out um, when there's a difference. Here are the learning objectives that were uh, sent out with the uh, invitation. And an outline of where we hope to get today. Uh, I'll try to strike a balance between talking too fast and, and uh, putting people to sleep. Um, but we're going to cover uh, some of the neuropathology of depression and then how we can address that particular neuropathology with the interventions that we have and some that are coming uh, in the future. ECT and TMS are what we spend, you know, 95% of our time doing. Um, so we'll focus on those two. We know the most about them and, and can offer them to your patients. Um, VNS and DBS, we also know a lot about less available, but hopefully um, more work will be done and we'll, we'll get there. And then a couple of other things that, that we'll get to that are just really neat, um, TDCS and TACS. And then the rest of the letters down there are things that are they're pretty new and, and people are just now looking at. So like the path today, um, it's long and winding, but there are a lot of people that came before us. The Egyptians used now catfish to treat nervous diseases. This is from uh, 3100 BCE. If you zoom in on the top, uh, you see this little guy, who's actually that big guy. Um, this the Nile catfish. The largest ones can discharge 400 volts. The, the Egyptians and later the um, uh, other, other uh, learned people in North Africa figured out to use the medium-sized ones to treat pain and other um, you know, nerve diseases. In the last half of the 18th century, Galvani experimented with frog legs. Uh, he discovered it if he put electricity across the muscles that they would contract. His nephew, Giovanni Aldini, uh, did some pretty gruesome, famous experiments, including this one in 1803, where he hooked up electricity to uh, the deceased um, prisoner who had just been executed, George Foster, um, and was getting him to make all kinds of gruesome facial, facial expression, getting his limbs to move. Faraday, uh, besides establishing the basis for elect the electromagnetic field itself, discovered electromagnetic induction, which is very important for our work. If you move a wire through a magnetic field or move a magnetic field around a wire, electricity flows. In 1870, uh, Hitzig and Fritsch demonstrated that if you apply electricity to specific areas of the exposed cortex of a dog, you can get muscles to contract. Um, so specific parts of the brain uh, translate to specific muscles. So they basically identified the motor strip. Um, this is a 1910 photo. Uh, this is Sylvanus Thompson. He used large magnets to uh, induce phosphines in his willing victims, um, thereby at least showing the concept that you could put some, some thing in a magnetic field, and the brain in this case, and get it to do stuff. Um, more familiar to a lot of us, in the 1950s, Penfield, he was in Canada, a neurosurgeon, along with his colleague, colleague Jasper, um, basically pioneered epilepsy surgery. Um, and they would stimulate the brain ahead of time um, before uh, doing the resection while the patients were conscious so they could more accurately target. And he basically mapped out the homunculus that we all learned in medical school and basically is the same map that we use today. Um, later in the 50s, Alexander Colin demonstrated that a fluctuating magnetic field, sensing a theme here, could stimulate peripheral fro frog muscles. Uh, and then in, from the 50s to the 70s, there was a researcher at Yale, Jose Manuel Rodriguez Delgado, who exper experimented with brain implants. So that's not new technology. Uh, in his most famous experiment in 1963, he was at a bull breeding ranch in Spain. And after inserting the, some of his receivers in some of the bulls, he stood in the bull ring and with one bull at a time uh, had uh, the bull charge at him and he pressed a button and the bull stopped. Um, and one of those is captured in the photograph there. He sort of went off the rails because he started talking about the future, how brain control would lead to a more peaceful society. And there were other things going on at Tulane and Harvard at the time, which were, you know, in one case, people were trying to cure homosexuality with brain implants. And so that 
cast a pallor over this type of work for a couple of decades um, before it was able to, to make a comeback. What is depression is an important question that we have to answer every day. Um, and since that's what we're trying to treat, we should at least talk about it here. Do we know it when we see it? Uh, this is a Renaissance engraving called Melancholia. There's a set of four of them. You know, you know when somebody is depressed by looking at them. Sometimes not. The beginning part of the last century, we had the uh, sort of psychoanalytic, um, psychodynamic formulation, which was melancholia as compared to mourning, was very abnormal. It was dangerous. There's a loss of self-regard. You feel worthless and despicable. Um, manifestations in the somatic realm, including difficulty with digestion, nourishment, sleeping. 1952, the first DSM, it was still rooted in that psychodynamic uh, principle, but it was a psychotic reaction versus a neurotic depressive reaction. And so there was basically um, that division between psychotic and neurotic. DSM progressed through its current version. Uh, most of us grew up with this, um, which is uh, two major symptoms for depression, low mood or loss of interest or pleasure, and then four or five of the remaining nine in the list. Um, I still use this mnemonic uh, pretty much every day. Some people will say, and, and we have to sometimes explain to family members or the patients themselves, it's not just you, it's not just stress. You don't need to just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Um, see, I say that a lot, but then, you know, actually, of course, there is a lot of research to show that stress, uh, environmental factors play a major role in depression. And so trying to walk that fine line between it's not your fault and your chaotic life is not making this any better. We've known for a long time about the uh, endocrine implications and the, and the endocrine uh, causes and things that are uh, associated with depression in the HPA axis. Um, the department that I trained in sort of built itself in the, in the 80s on the hope that we would find the biomarker uh, in either the um, um, cortisol level or the uh, suppression test, and it didn't quite work out, although we still use that in, in select cases. It's a chemical imbalance, so this is the biggest sort of useful explanation for lay people to reduce, reduce stigma, but the most misleading and frustrating for, for some of us. If it's just a chemical imbalance, so this is an, uh, the next slide here, you see a couple of the medications and uh, noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor um, and a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. If it's a chemical imbalance, how come these drugs take so long to work? This is just a short list of the neurochemical systems that correlate with depression. We won't go through that. It's cellular. These are the cell changes that happen with depression. Again, not even a complete list, but we see volume losses in certain parts of the brain. We can do um, histology uh, and autopsy samples and see specific uh, cellular changes in people who have depression. Um, it's cellular and chemical. So these are the cascades of things that can happen um, both with the hormones that are increased in depression and then with treatment, with the uh, inhibitors that we use to treat. We know it's genetic. Um, in this study, the heritability of major depressive disorder was in somewhere in the 30 to 40 percent range, not as heritable, heritable as bipolar or schizophrenia, but we know that it runs in families. That's part of a, any careful history. Um, this is part of the reason. So there's a specific gene, which is for one of the serotonin transporters. And there are two different alleles, short and long. And people who are homozygous for uh, short, for their, their short short, are more susceptible to depression. They also don't respond to some of the first-line treatments as well as people who are long, long do. And that also has to do with stress and environmental factors and their resilience. So it's kind of a resilience gene, which can both be frustrating for people who have depression, but also um, can, can encourage them that there is resilience and they can work on that. Got to find the right spot in the brain. That, you know, the 1990s, I think, was the decade of the brain, and people were really excited about just finding the, the, the place and, and fixing it. Um, the Raffi nucleus uh, makes uh, all of the serotonin in the brain and has projections a lot of different places. Um, the circadian rhythm is very important. 
the um, suprachiasmatic nucleus is really important. And, and interestingly, sleep is one of the first things that gets better with effective depression treatment. Um, these other areas we'll get to when we talk about deep brain stimulation, and there are a, as a whole list of more. So back to this slide, the serotonin transporter gene um, in people who are the short, short uh, um, phenotypes or, or genotypes, their phenotype, one of the phenotypes they show is less connection between um, uh, the amygdala and the um, uh, paragenual anter anterior cingulate. And then the long, long people have more of those connections. So everything's starting to sort of come together. So this is the network hypothesis. So healthy networks in your brain, depression disrupts some of those networks. Treatment really overdrives network formation. Even some extra ones are made. And then the recovered patient, you prune back the networks that, that you don't need, and you're back to what is hopefully a, a healthy uh, equilibrium. This is just a cool picture. Um, we're going to skip the first two lines. But the bottom one shows what some of the state of the art is as far as figuring out where these networks are and how to intervene on them. Um, the middle bottom picture is uh, the relationship between different regions. So you define the target region that you're looking at, and then you see how it correlates with all the other regions in the brain. So it is dependent on finding the right target region to start with. Then the bottom right is. Uh, um, whole brain tractography, it's uh, DTI, diffusion tensor imaging, which, you know, it's pretty, and I'm not just trying to show you pretty slides, but it does illustrate, and I've actually used this, showed this picture to a patient yesterday, it illustrates that, you know, these are circuits, these are wires, these are paths, and, and people can understand that. Um, I'm going to skip this one for now. And this is just another picture of how a lot of the uh, uh, articles these days are displaying these networks. So this is the default mode network, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but it's very much implicated in depression. So connections between these different brain regions and, and how we our treatments help that, they change it, but how we can possibly, in the future, use something like this even as a biomarker. That work is going on right now. This is just another pretty picture of the default mode network. And then finally, um, Neurogenesis, neuroplasticity. So that's really where the field is now. And that's the overarching principle that ties together everything else that we just talked about. Um, we know, and it was not too long ago that we figured out that you're not just um, stuck with the neurons that you're born with. There are regions of the brain where you can make new ones. Um, in the first column there, A, chronic stress reduces the number of dendritic spines. So the top one is a normal, and the bottom one is a patient. Um, in the middle, column B, chronic stress can reduce the length and complexity of dendrites. Um, the green is the normal, the red is the patient. And in column C, chronic stress can impair neurogenesis. And uh, we see that in the lab, and now we understand that in places like the hippocampus, where we need to make neur neurons to recover, the stress can really prevent that. So this is just an overarching diagram to show that everything we just talked about is included. Um, it's a pretty complete way to think about the disease that we try to treat. So we've had medications now for more than 50 years. In the early 50s, um, two physicians working at a, a tuberculosis hospital in Staten Island began a trial on new anti-tuberculosis drugs, and they, people got a little bit happy, sometimes to the point where um, there was a subtle general stimulation, and the patients exhibited renewed vigor, and indeed, this occasionally served to introduce disciplinary problems. Uh, so they got a little bit too happy at times. These were the precursors to what we still use as our go-to uh, MAOI uh, medications. Later in that decade, um, the, the tricyclics came on the scene, um, sort of a different process uh, in Switzerland, but it was beneficial to patients, especially those who had mental and motor retardation, who were melancholic, basically. Um, and then the chemists got involved and figured out how to reduce the side effects, which is um, why we have uh, better choices in tricyclic antidepressants than, than we used to. And now we have an array. Um, we don't, we use, our group uses MAOIs and tricyclics more than most. Um, but then there's an array of many other things, some of which you're probably very familiar with, um, and then some of, of which are, are actually pretty new, although most of them do pretty much the same thing. This is a 
almost complete list of everything that's available as far as antidepressant um, pharmacopoeia and uh, just illustrates sort of the dizzying number of, of things that people sometimes try. Um, this is the list that we reference for patients when they're giving us their medication history. Um, and a good number of them will, will mark off a majority of, of those agents. And those are just the antidepressants, um, not including antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, benzodiazepines. So people are really just suffering and trying a lot of different things before they get to us. And then this slides back to neurogenesis a little bit. Um, antidepressants increase proliferation, they increase maturation, they increase survival. ECT and deep brain stimulation do the same thing. It's really the only other thing that's just as good as, as, as cannabis. That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> which, which drug do we choose? So you, know, you pick the one that you like or the one that you're most, most familiar with. Stardy tried to give us some sort of a, 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 a some sort of an algorithm. Um, we still reference this study a lot. Uh, it was done uh, the last decade. And the level one, people were put on citalopram. Then level two, you started either augmenting or switching. Level three, made a switch or added lithium or, or, or uh, cytomel. Level four, made another switch and put them on an MEOI or uh, venlafaxine. And we thought, you know, this was going to be great. We're going to see if what we're actually doing in practice comes out in the, in the science. It was really discouraging because it proved another thing that we also sort of knew, which was that these things don't work all that well. Um, the citalopram patients, a third of them, would respond or remit. Um, by the time you make step two, step three, you get another, another third, perhaps. But by the time you get to the fourth step in the algorithm, not many more people are getting better. You hit a ceiling. This is looking at it the other direction. So this is the likelihood of remission or response as you go through different um, as you go through different steps. And so by the time you get to three prior treatment failures, the chances that another medication is going to cause or affect a response or remission is is seven percent or less. And remember, I mentioned that a lot of our patients have tried 10, 12, 15 medications with all kinds of, you know, well-informed but um, ineffective augmentation strategies. So that brings us to treatment-resistant depression, which people argue about what that is. Um, I really like this illustration of it. This, the the x-axis there is the failed uh, treatment attempts. And don't worry about the y-axis. That's the number of people in this uh, 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 estimated in this cohort. Um, but it shows basically our practice. So people um, at their primary care doctor will try first or second line agent um, we're working with Swedish right now on their depression pathway in primary care and how to do that in a, first of all, evidence-based, but also, you know, um, considered and measured and, and data-based way. Um, sometimes they'll get to the second or third agent before they refer to a psychiatrist at all. Um, and then they try some other things and nothing is working. You see ECT in there. The average ECT patient in this analysis had already tried six things. That's average. Um, TMS kind of fits in there a little bit below ECT. Most of the criteria are for antidepressant trials. Um, but, you know, these are people sometimes who've been on 20. These are predictors of treatment resistance, the strongest predictors. Um, the chronicity, multiple failures. Uh, the severity, those sort of make sense. Um, so something that we've been talking about with the Swedish uh, depression pathway is, should these be reasons to refer somebody sooner to the TRD expert or to even just to the psychiatrist, to the behavioral health team? I like this. This is an elegant uh, sort of scoring rubric for treatment resistance. There are a couple of out there, um, but this one takes into account all the medication trials, um, how severe the symptoms are. And so in a data-driven sort of keep track of everything uh, world that we're working in, this type of thing is very helpful because you can see what your outcomes are based on how severe, how treatment resistant the patients were when they came to you. Yeah. Well, ideally, it's both a, a, ther a therapist, psychology, you know, master's level or a PhD level psychologist and a psychiatrist or, or an ARNP. 
we don't have that, but that's the ideal. Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah. Well, the, the pathway is going to be depending on severity. So moderate, mild to moderate is basically a coin flip between meds or therapy. Severe is meds plus or minus therapy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And when I say, I, mean, I, should, I, should, I should be specific about that. When I say therapy, that's more or less what I'm talking about. So at least brief um, evidence-based uh, behavioral-oriented, CBT-oriented interventions have been shown to be pretty effective and even in primary care settings. We're talking eight meetings. I mean, these are designed to not be long-term therapy relationships. Eight meetings, something like that. Yeah. So the first uh, brain simulation treatment that we'll talk about is ECT. So we are a little bit unique in, in, in the ECT world or in the brain stimulation world that we take referrals from everybody. So a lot of the places that do the same type of work that we do only take referrals from other psychiatrists. But we get patients who find us on the web or hear about us from a friend. Um, we get patients directly from primary care um, because there is such a, you know, with um, uh, the late uh, Dr. Caton and the UW and all the work that they've done, there is a lot more of a, an awareness in primary care in this area and people willing to make these types of referrals because these you know, family docs and internists out there are caring for pretty, pretty tough patients sort of on their own. So they come to us for an evaluation. We do a standard psychiatric evaluation with some extra focus on um, their past treatment trials, like I mentioned, other factors that might get in the way or be a contraindication for brain stimulation. And then basically with the patient, because that's extremely important to us, that you know, our anti-stigma stance and our working with the patient stance means that they have a lot of say in what we do next. And so even if the case is not, you know, the most severe we've ever seen, if the patient would like to pursue ECT and we think that's a reasonable option, we're going to do it because that's what they want and that's what they're most um, uh, interested in. But we'll tell them, that, you know, what the odds are. We'll tell them what the, what the pros and the cons are. Sometimes they need further workup before we can proceed with a medical issue, um, you know, a, 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 a stent or uh, either, either in their brain or their heart, um, other things that might, you know, become a complication. Sometimes they haven't tried enough medication or we think that there are some things that have been missed and we'll refer them back to um, where they came from or we'll take over their medication management for a little bit to see if we can get things optimized. So these are the indications for ECT. Um, the vast majority of the patients who get ECT everywhere with us included are, is for a depressive episode, um, especially with psychotic or catatonic features. Um, one of the reasons to do ECT right away is if somebody's acutely suicidal, even if they haven't tried that many different things. Um, and in patients who, uh, for whom med medications present a higher risk, and actually this includes uh, in, in pregnancy. So there are people, we have patients who, um, you know, if they're pregnant, they choose ECT over even a second or third medication trial because it's actually safer, even though we do have to manage things a little bit more closely. And then these other things that um, aren't necessarily related to depression, but we sometimes will see people for. There is a large increase in cerebral blood flow and in ICP, and that's actually the main issue that we have to watch out for with medical comorbidities and in the treatment room. Also, there's a parasympathetic discharge during the stimulus, so we do have people on a daily basis who have, you know, six to eight seconds of asystole, um, and then some other uh, uh, changes on their strip that the anesthesiologist is watching closely. Um, and then also hypotension and salivation. But during the seizure, then, the opposite happens. And so people get tachycardic, and that's when you can sometimes get, you know, more scary arrhythmias. Um, it, that happens very rarely. And, uh, you know, a good seizure and a good tachycardic response is, is a sign of, of hopefully um, some, some effective treatment. And then diabetic patients, we have to be very careful, both because we make them wait NPO, but also um, their, their sugar can surge um, after the treatment. So there are a couple of absolute contraindications to ECT. Um, a supervisor of mine always said the only one was power failure. Uh, and so I always have to include that. Um, which is why, which is, uh, Michelle, who's in, here in the audience, tells me that's the real reason that we start late on Thursdays is because they test the generators. Um, theochromocytoma, and then anything, any pathology where you already have an increased intracranial pressure. 
there then are a lot of relative contraindications. If we make sure something is managed, we can do it. Um, brain tumors, it's been done safely. Stroke, it's been done safely. Um, we have a lot of heart patients. High-risk pregnancies, um, we do those treatments, especially if they're third trimester at, at First Hill. Um, but we, we definitely do it. And then even people with other intracranial pathology, as long as it's stable. Um, I won't go through this whole thing, but basically it is a process, uh, starting with us in the office and then going through a couple of steps. And then when they get to the ECT area, you know, they go through this whole procedure. We make sure that everything is safe. We do the safety pause and then we have the right, right treatment, right patient, um, confirm that they were MPO, and then, you know, do the dosing and things like that that I won't really get into much today. Um, the whole process usually takes an hour and a half or so um, when things are running well from when they show up to when they're able to usually walk out of the, of the area with their family member or friend. Two of the, uh, the two most popular lead placements or electrode placements are unilateral, right unilateral ECT and bilateral ECT or bitemporal ECT, uh, same thing. Um, there are groups that also do a lot of bifrontal ECT. Um, I won't get too much into the difference between them because I want to get into, get into other things. But there are considerations in terms of the cognitive side effects, um, the uh, relative efficacy, um, brain pathology. We have a patient now who's getting left unilateral ECT um, because of a, uh, a CVA. And so there just isn't enough tissue on the right side to make this work. Um, but these are some of the things we talked about in the evaluation with the patient. And they may have done some reading ahead of time or talked to their psychiatrist. And they may have preferences about this too. And this is, this is a little bit more controversial actually that, you know, a lot of centers, a lot of especially, um, uh, you know, where they're not necessarily affiliated or connected to an academic center will almost primarily do right unilateral ECT. The problem with unilateral ECT is that sometimes it doesn't work and you have to switch to bilateral ECT. And it's a little bit more assertive to just start with bilateral ECT. We do that in patients who need it and we do that in patients, unless there's a real contraindication, who request it. Um, but that's a, a very intensive back and forth sometimes in terms of what the risks and, and potential benefits are. This is a figure that shows um, what the, uh, uh, the field strength is. So the top row of the first three, uh, you'll see this again, but the first three are ECT. So bitemporal, bifrontal, and right unilateral. Um, so basically, you know, we're, we're several times above the strength needed to get the neurons doing what we want them to do. And that's a problem. We, and we certainly acknowledge that. But the A, B, and C are um, the different types of ECT. So just a little bit, we set the charge. People ask, well, how much voltage, how much electricity do I get? So the dose that we communicate in, like the milligram dose for medications, is the charge or the millicoulomb dose. And there are several things that go into that. The thing highlighted in red is that the charge um, is the uh, current, the amperage, the pulse width, which we'll, uh, I'll show you in a second, the frequency, and then how long of a train people get. These things basically all go into a formula, and the machine spits out the charge. And that's what we, that's what we talk about. To compare it, and this is not a completely scientifically sound <laughs> comparison, but it's the best one that I could come up with. Um, you, everybody knows what, how light bulbs work. So a defibrillator, which delivers 360 joules over 10 milliseconds, would be equivalent to a 36,000 watt light bulb. Um, ECT at maximum dose is 100 joules over 8 seconds. It's like a 12 watt light bulb. There are different ways to look at it. I know and it's the current that does damage. Um, ECT does not cause brain damage, but people talk about these things. If you look at some of the um, Scientology websites and things like that, they talk about comparing, you know, you're basically sticking your finger in a light socket, and that's just not true. So this is the MECTA device. This is one of two of the most widely used devices in the States. And so zooming in here a little bit, we set those four parameters, and then the output in the top box there is the charge. And so we calculate their dose based on different things uh, that the patient um, brings in or based on a titration. And then that's how we talk to each other. I, I treated this person today at 2.30. The seizure was sort of junky looking, so let's increase it to 3.45 next time. And so then we put in those inputs to decide what to do. That's what the, the pulse looks like. So the pulse width, um, the frequency is pulses per second, and then the current of course, and then the duration is how long that whole train is. And I could give a whole three talks on the history of ECT and sine waves and, and how this is better than it used to be. This is the other major device, uh, just for the sake of fairness, this is the Thymatron. 
So this is how we're treating somebody. Um, this is their flow sheet from Epic, uh, the course of ECT. Um, the first one uh, there, this was, we did an age-based dosing here. So this is bitemporal ECT. And with bitemporal ECT, you can uh, do a formula based on the patient's age and figure out the starting dose. And this very, very well responding, fortunate patient stayed at that dose. And uh, the second line of numbers there is a PHQ score. You can see that decreasing um, almost linearly uh, as, as we progress to the treatments. Um, so this is kind of the, the raw data that we're working with. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint you, and, and we disappoint a lot of patients. We're not looking at their brain waves. I mean, we're looking at their brain waves, but we're not analyzing their brain waves to see if their depression is better. We're looking at how long the seizure is, the quality of the seizure, as far as some of the parameters that we've learned are important. And that's about it. ECT works. I mean, that's the message here. Um, if you're looking closely, these are all old studies because we don't do sham uh, ECT studies anymore. Um, the thought is that that would be uh, unethical. So uh, the, the newest one here, I think, is 1980, maybe, um, 1985. But you know the meta-analyses show that it works. Um, these are um, ECT versus medication. Again, the theme is, the only reason I'm showing this slide, not to get into the nitty gritty, is that it works. Now we did do, we uh, is a broad term, but a, a, a group of our colleagues did do a study over the, the last 20 years, which you know, would use more modern uh, methodology and try to optimize the, the treatment parameters. Um, a study of about 500 patients and uh, the six or seven papers that came out of that have really gone a long way to inform our practice today. So even though the technology itself hasn't changed in a long time, you know, we're applying it in different ways. Um, this is from that, that study called the core, core study. So these are the changes in the Hamilton depression score. Um, the psychotic patients, the psychotically depressed patients, and the non-psychotically depressed patients. So 37 is kind of a, a moderate to severe. Um, at the end of ECT, you know, six is considered remission. Um, the survival curve, uh, this was a, a, a related study that looked at what do we do after we're done with the acute ECT? Do we do continuation ECT um, once a month, once every other month, or do we do medication? This was, um, I mean, pretty remarkable. It showed that they were equivalent. Um, sometimes we actually do both because people don't seem to, to you know, it doesn't seem to stick with one or the other. But this is 24 months. There have been longer um, uh, evaluations, but 24 months, still better than 50% uh, remained in, in remission. And then this is comparing the, the three lead placements I was talking about, basically equivalent as long as you dose it right. This is suicidal uh, ideation and suicidal uh, risk. Um, so the bars uh, represent patients that had a, a high score on the suicide question on the Hamilton Depression Index. So basically a third of the patients were probably suicidal enough to get admitted to the hospital. Um, after 10 or 11 ECT treatments, that went effectively to zero. And then this is actually the, the ones that, that I find the most remarkable. These are um, quality of life measures. Um, the short form 36 is a well regarded and, and uh, validated quality of life measure. So this is a little bit confusing. I apologize for that. But the dark is normal. The middle is just, just depressed. And then the, the light ones are the ECT outpatients. So their quality of life started. These are all the different uh, uh, domains on that measure. Their quality of life starts out low and improves markedly with the ECT. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip um, the mechanisms. Glutamate is the hotness now. And ECT definitely affects glutamate. And we talked about neurotrophic um, changes, too. It does have adverse effects. Nobody's disputing that. Uh, Postictal confusion is a big deal that we deal with all the time. Memory loss is the thing that people worry about the most. Um, very short-term retrograde amnesia is pretty common. It's, you know, the, the memories around the course of ECT aren't going to be strong. Um, Things that happen before you started ECT sometimes can be uh, affected too. Most of that comes back in, in the vast majority of patients. Autobiographical is something that people have been looking at more recently. Um, I'll get to that in a second. So these are people um, 
uh, within three days of their course of ECT, so zero is normal or, or their baseline. And these are the different measures on the neurocognitive screen. They're lower, um, but 15 or more days out, um, you know, people were either at baseline or, or actually better. And so this is reassuring to patients to see that, yes, you're going to feel like you're, you're confused or foggy for a while, but things will eventually be even better than when we started. And this is from the autobiographical work. Um, it gets a little bit tricky, and there are different ways to go about this. But basically, the gist is that there are changes in autobiographical memory, of memory of events from the past. Personal events generally are OK. Impersonal events, so we're talking like, um, for, uh, when I was 10 years old, I remember getting up really early to watch the um, inauguration um, of George H.W. Bush. You know, that sort of thing, that's an impersonal event that may not still be there after a course of ECT, and especially, unfortunately, after a course of bilateral ECT. There are nuances here. We talk to patients about this, but, you know, this is just to, to further elucidate, and so we can, can we, we can tell people what to expect. So this is the take home message. So your choices are fourth medication or ECT. So this is the likelihood of response. This is likelihood of remission. Um, and these are already treatment resistant patients. And then this is the likelihood of not having a response. And so when we're talking to other providers, this is sometimes how we um, will, will, you know, talk about it because sometimes when you get lost in the statistics, it's hard to see it this way, but when this is what the this is what the patient is facing. Transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS. Um, same process. They come and see us. Uh, sometimes it's just like you know, please fix my patient. Sometimes they're specifically referred for TMS. Um, same exact processes with ECT, although less medical workup is needed. Um, usually none, unless they have a specific issue. The indications are much more narrow. Um, the FDA indication is, uh, these are for the four commercially available TMS devices, basically treatment resistant patients who have failed multiple antidepressants. The insurance criteria, however, is much more uh, well defined. Usually, or always has to be adults, um, kids are off label. Uh, most of the time not bipolar, although some allow that. They have very strict criteria about the number of antidepressants, et cetera. And most people have had, had to have failed also cognitive behavioral therapy. These are other things that people are looking at TMS for. Um, some, of the, some centers offer treatments for this. Um, we will, as well, as long as there's good understanding between us and the patient that it's off-label and you know, what the risks and benefits are as far as that goes. But we talked to them about what the studies show so far. Contraindications, really the only absolute one is metal within 30 centimeters of the coil, although dental work is okay. Um, the rest of these are relative, sort of in order of, of how concerned we are. Um, but TMS has been done in, in patients as long as some of these things are, are uh, considered and the, the method that you're using is optimized so that you're not going to, for example, you know, cause their AICD to fire. So these are the four approved devices. Um, the first one, top left, is the Brainsway device, and the bottom right is the Neurostar device. So those are the sort of um, two that have been around the longest. Uh, I shouldn't say that. The two that have been approved the longest. Um, the other two, the bottom right and the top left, have been around for a very long time. Uh, but they were used in neurology for diagnosis purposes and for other brain stimulation research. And they only recently got cleared by the FDA for treatment, uh, clinical treatment in depression. So those, that's the Mag, uh, Mag Stim and the uh, Mag Vita or Mag Pro. Um, so we use MagPro uh, quite a bit, and so this is just tells you what the uh, uh, protocol is. We do measurements. We find basically the F3 spot, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, the patient's wearing a reusable cap that we use, and we double check that spot every so often. And then uh, once we find their motor threshold uh, by hunting around basically on their motor strip and trying to get their thumb to twitch, we adjust the dose just so we're just getting a twitch. Um, and then the treatments are dosed as a percentage of that, 120% of motor threshold usually. Um, and then the coil is placed over F3, and the treatment proceeds. This is what it looks like. Um, this is one of our staff members and uh, a model patient doing um, placement of the MagPro in the upper. And then this is a stock photo of the Brainsway helmet. The, the protocol is a little bit different with that device because it is a helmet. Um, 
So we're back to Faraday's law <coughs> in electromagnetic induction. What we're actually doing is on the right, which is turning the magnet on and off, um, which is an effect moving something through a magnetic field or you know moving the magnetic field around the nerves, um, the neurons, and causing them to fire. Um, so the, these devices are about equivalent to uh, older or standard MRIs, um, not the really really fancy ones, but 1.5 to 3 Tesla. And this just, we don't use this whole headgear thing, but this just shows, you know, kind of a, an illustration of what's happening. So we're stimulating the cortex underneath the spot where the coil is. And we're talking about two and a half to three centimeters at the most for the standard devices and four centimeters at the most for the, the deep TMS. So even deep TMS isn't really deep. Uh, we call this the brain stabbing one. Um, this is from uh, the textbook written by uh, Suzanne Kearns' mentor and it's a kind of an unfortunate illustration, but it's another way of looking at it. Um, so this shows you the top B is the is the deep TMS, and then the bottom ones are the other two, the Neurostar and the MagPro. Um, this is the field strength, again, much more focal than the ECT where the whole thing was read. Um, the one on the bottom right is if we really did want to stimulate with magnets deeper structures. And the only problem with that is you would basically cook the surface. I mean, this, the field would be way too strong. You, you, you lose focality when it comes to um, strength. High frequency TMS um, with the device that we use is 10 hertz for four seconds, followed by an eight second pause, then another four second train, and then eight second pause. The, the pause length is, is variable. Um, that goes on for you know, 3,000, 4,000 pulses. Um, sometimes up to 6,000 pulses. Low frequency TMS is one hertz. Click, click, click um, for, for 1,500 or so pulses. So this is a table of what we use most of the time. The high frequency TMS is FDA approved uh, for depression. Um, the, so that's the tried and true, you know, high left is what, what people get. Um, the brain sway is a little bit of a different protocol, but basically the same thing. Then low frequency, right TMS, is off-label, although it's an adjunctive treatment for depression itself and also for anxiety uh, that we use quite a bit. Same type of forest plots as we had for ECT, it works. This is from the pivotal study for the deep TMS. So deep TMS versus sham, drop in Hamilton scores. Um, same thing, remission response. I'm going to speed up a little bit here. It sticks. That's the other major take home is it sticks better than ECT even. Uh, this remission lasted 12 months. So people who remitted um, the survival curve there at the bottom stayed in remission uh, for 12 months. Um, and so the remission rate that we quote people, or I'm sorry, the relapse rate, rate that we usually quote people, again, with good management afterward is 10 to 15%. And, and you, you know, Look at ECT, and it's 50% or better in some, in some circumstances. I'm going to skip this. So again, you're a patient. You're facing a fourth medication or TMS. Remission rates are lower with, than with ECT, but of course, it's a lot less invasive. And again, your chances of not responding. VNS, um, we wish we could do more of it. Uh, it seems to work better the longer it's in. Sorry. Um, our neurosurgeon colleagues uh, implant um, these electrodes are wrapped around the vagus nerve, and then the generator is put in like a pacemaker. Um, it's not an acute treatment. These, uh, these don't reach significance. Um, this was 12 weeks, and you know people say, well, it didn't work. But the FDA approved it anyway because it showed promise and these are people who are suffering. Um, and if you wait longer, it does work. So this is a 24-month study. 43% um, of subjects had a response, and 21% had remission. And so these are the patients that we, you know, that we think about VNS as we've done ECT and or TMS. They're still, it's hard to keep them well. It's, it, we can sometimes get them into remission, but it doesn't stick. Um, this is when we think about a vagal nerve uh, stimulator. <clears throat> this is um, this was a number needed to treat analysis that if you wait long enough uh, shows that it's actually comparable to ECT. So the number needed to treat for benefit at 96 weeks with VNS was four, and ECT is between three and five. 
I'm going to skip this. Lots of projections um, from the uh, structures that the vagus, the vagus nerves, uh, uh, the afferent um, fibers innervate. Um, and that's how VNS works, is it makes these changes in these structures, including, again, neurogenesis, um, making new nerves in the hippocampus because of VNS. Adverse effects most, mostly is hoarseness and cough. Um, there have been people who got hypomanic or manic. So these are people who are looking at their sixth med or their twelfth med. The chances of responding are even lower. VNS doesn't work great at three months. Certainly doesn't separate in remission at three months. Um, but if you get to twelve months, we're seeing something. Deep brain stimulation is in process. Um, the idea is you put a, a stimulator in the white matter around the area that you know where where there's a node for communication and the circuits involved in depression. Um, these are the rough brain areas and some of the symptom associations. And so these are the two primary targets that have been looked at the most. There are others, and there will be others in the future. Um, there was a um, there were double-blind studies going for both of these, both of which have been ended early um, because the futility analyses weren't that great. And so basically, people weren't getting better um, fast enough to justify the risk of continuing. And so both groups are, are back to the drawing board, and hopefully there'll be a, an updated protocol um, coming out, and we can, we can keep working on this. Because it, for the people, in, in the people for whom it works, it's remarkable. Um, these are the these are the cases you may have read about in the lay press where people wake up or they're they're actually awake in the operating room, but they turn the thing on and suddenly there's more color or they hear music and they never heard it before. Um, so it works, but it is very risky. We need a better understanding of the networks. Um, one of the thoughts is that the, the, we just weren't using enough electricity. Um, are there better targets? Were we picking the wrong patients? And then the really interesting kind of newer stuff, uh, transcranial direct current stimulation. Um, so basically, this is hooking a battery up to your head. It really is. Uh, and this has been going on for 80 years. Uh, the Russians used it a lot uh, back, back in the day. Um, this, I won't get into the details, but it does show that it cha makes changes. These are, these are um, changes in metabolism. Um, after a uh, TDCS session. Bilateral TDCS makes changes um, more than, than unilateral. And so the idea is that you figure out what spot you want to stimulate and you put one of the leads over that. And then the more modern um, protocols is you put the other lead somewhere away from the, from the um, anode. And so this is a sham uh, uh, TDCS and, and medication trial. So 50 milligrams of sertraline plus minus TDCS, actually separated. You know, there was actually uh, statistic statistical significance at six weeks. So um, both the medication and TDCS were better than, than either one alone. Um, the TDCS was the same as 50 milligrams of sertraline. You may recognize that that's a low dose of sertraline, but it's, it's something. A lot of safety disclaimers. Um, TDCS apparently uh, induces people um, to unbutton their shirt. Um, the devices that are commercially available are marketed at a certain group <laughs> or certain groups. I won't say if I'm a member of one of those or not, but um, there, there's a huge gamer culture and a whole sort of like overclock your brain or overdrive your brain. And, and you know, it's a subset of this whole neuro, um, you know, uh, neuro optimization uh, that people talk about. Um, it can cause problems. People build these things at home. And you know it can like cause real damage. So you know this is way way off label. This is investigational. People have asked us about it all the time. Um, it's a tough conversation because they think we're hiding something from them. So it's a cool idea. It does something, uh, as my colleague Suzanne says. There maybe there's some there there, um, but more work is needed. TACS. We also have people asking us about it all the time because the Fisher Wallace device. Stop depression in two weeks or your money back. And this is where we get, you know, it's a little bit hard to walk the line between snake oil and cutting edge. Um, 
it's a different thing. It's an alternating current and it's much less of it. So this treatment or this intervention is all about trying to entrain the uh, neurons, not just overdrive them. And so you see here different illustrations of the alternating current stimulation, different frequencies and different um, amplitudes, and what the brain does in response. So it, do it does something. There's no question about that. Um, but will it do something useful for us and for our patients? Um, these people uh, were in a trial of, uh, for anxiety and comorbid depression. So depression wasn't the primary outcome. And they weren't that depressed to begin with. But it separated, so they, they touted on the website as being a treatment for depression. And then this was a different uh, study with some med you know, methodologic problems, but actually the patients were a little bit more depressed to start with, and maybe they were starting to separate um, by the second week. And these are all really short pilot studies. Nobody's done a long-term um, study of this yet. And it won't burn your skin. So. If you can bear with me for a couple more minutes, there are a couple of other modalities that are on the horizon. Magnetic seizure therapy, which is illustrated in the bottom three figures there. Basically, there's a, two different approaches to try to get a seizure without all the collateral, um, I keep saying the word damage, without all the collateral um, you know, side effects, without all the other problems. So the magnetic seizure therapy gets you a seizure, which most people still think is the therapeutic part of ECT, um, but you don't get other parts of the brain affected that don't need to be. And it shows a response. Um, people's uh, HAM, uh, HAMD scores went from uh, 28 to 8. That's from moderate depression to remission. Um, this is the cognitive profile. This is actually why they're trying to figure this out. So baseline versus post-treatment. And it was either better or the same. So the memory side effects are pretty much nil. People wake up very quickly after this procedure. Um, it doesn't work as well, though. It's only about half as effective uh, as ECT. But that may be a, you know, further optimization might let it work better. And it may be a, a stopping point, you know, maybe a station where we get there before we have to go to ECT. Um, I'm going to skip EPCS, even though it's really cool. And then FEAST is the other exciting thing. And Dr. Kearns, who's one of our colleagues, who actually was part of some of this work at MUSC. This is um, the upper left uh, or upper right uh, number or letter D. It's again a way to try to get a seizure with a more focal stimulus. So not having all the extra side effects because you're, you're um, getting the whole brain um, with more charge than it needs. And so these are modified electrodes with modified placement. Um, the uh, the graph here is, you know, just shows it's very promising. Um, that red line is where they change some electrode, uh, change the size of the electrode to further optimize it. Um, but this is percent change in the HAMD in, in the depression index. So, 50% change in most of the patients. And once they did further optimization of the intervention, more people were getting better. Um, so, very promising. And just like with the magnetic seizure therapy, people had much better cognitive parameters. And the future, future. Um, we were just talking about this beforehand, transcranial ultrasound. Um, number five there is what was done in a study that was looking at pain, um, where actually there was a kind of a secondary depression measure, and it changed in the room. And so with ultrasound, people are excited about it because um, you can get a lot more focus in, on deeper structures without affecting the structures uh, between, but it's hard to get through bone. Just like, I mean, it's just like with ECT, it's hard to get through bone and skin. This is um, uh, transdermal uh, VNS. So you're stimulating the, a, branch of, a branch of a subbranch of a subbranch of the vagus nerve, uh, the auricular um, subbranch, and basically doing the same thing without having to implant a device. Um, the early study, uh, two weeks. Again, versus sham, it's separated in terms of change in the Beck depression inventory. This was something that came out very recently out of um, Boston, a group, um, the, uh, a neurostem research group, um, low field magnetic stimulation. Basically, stick your head in this thing and you feel better by the end of the session. Um, I guess I probably didn't, you know, give give context, but part of what we're looking for is a way to help people who are suicidally depressed now. A way to help them today. And so if something like this, even if it's not perfect or doesn't work for everybody, if it can dial that notch down from, yes, I'm going to go kill myself to, 
I'll think about it for a couple of days and, and let you work with me, that would be huge. And that would be a, a, a enormous advance for us. Um, and so this was immediate. These were, these were effects at uh, 40 minutes. So the only one that did separate statistically was um, when they threw all the subjects in. They tried to separate out bipolar versus unipolar, um, and the statistics weren't there. But there was a change. Thanks so much. Questions? Mm -hmm.